I, how, how, how does this relate to me? It's like, no, you actually, we're small. Mm. Small itty bitty people. And God is big. And, and God has a story that he's telling you. This is the Prayer Culture Podcast. Uh, welcome to the podcast today. Uh, so today we have a very, 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 very special guest, uh, <laughs> Catherine Miller. How many she, berries was that? That wow. was the most I've ever done. So never injured yeah. me like that. Because <laughs> <laughs> he likes me better. You're yeah. you're special too, Patrick. Yeah. Do you feel better? No. <laughs> Just go on, talk to your friend. Uh, okay, so uh, today we're going to be talking about a subject that's uh, really relevant to everything going on in life and uh, just praying for Israel. It's something that um, is hotly debated just on like how we should because uh, there are different views on Israel's place and role uh, in in um, God's plan and uh, at we as Christians, like, okay, how are we supposed to pray for them specifically? Um, as opposed to how we pray for other nations. And so one thing I'm just going to share from the get-go, just for clarity's sake, every Christian wants to pray for the people in Israel. Like, I think all Christians can agree. They're unsafe people in Israel, and we want them to be saved, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But the difference is that's true for any nation on the earth, right? That's true for any people on the earth. That's why we go as missionaries to unreach people groups. We're going to see people in in those groups saved, right? So really the question is there, is there a difference for Israel specifically? And uh, and what can that look like? So just to give a little theological framework on some different schools of thought about Israel's place in God's plan. Um, There's... uh, Replacement theology, they hate when you call it that, Uh, (laughs) but for lack of a better term, replacement theology, I I think I heard Jeff Durbin say grafted or something like that, grafted theology, because it sounded better to him. But but basically, there's like a complete version of that where it's like, okay, the church replaces Israel in every respect, every promise of God, everything belongs to the church now, Um, and, and Israel can come into that. Um, by accepting Jesus as Messiah, but it's not like Israel as a people has any distinctness now Mm -hmm. in the New Covenant. So then there's like what I'd call a semi-replacement theology, where it's there are theologians that like don't recognize the modern state of Israel as God's people, right? They'd say, well, that's, that's not really God's people because they're in rebellion against the Messiah, but there are promises and prophecies about Israel that will take place in the end times that are distinctly for Israel. Um, and then there's more like a, a dispensational, classical, premillennial thought process um, that the modern nation state of Israel is actually a fulfillment of prophecy. And so there is something distinct about how we pray for them as a people group. Like all these people in Israel have some form of blessing by God and all these promises. And so we always must defend them, always must um, pray for them specifically as a whole nation, not just as individuals. Um, So those are kind of some of the schools of thought. Um, A few misconceptions that are kind of out there. Um, We need to really be kind here. Uh, I know a lot of people who believe replacement theology that are not anti-Semite. So um, there's some clouded history there, uh, but don't blame the children for the sins of the fathers. Like Hmm. they're not anti-Semites for believing that, Um, you know, and this podcast also is not about at all about whether America should be involved in Israeli conflicts. Uh, militarily or anything like that. We're not talking about how America is blessed as a nation because of blessed, like defending Israel or anything like that. Um, My assertion is that we as Christians should be more concerned about how Israel relates to prophecy and what the New Testament says than we should be concerned about our country being involved. Um, right. Relationship as a nation. between political nations. Yeah, that's that's not what we're about today. Uh, we're we're talking about as Christians, 
what is God call us to ask him to do on behalf of Israel? So with some of those precursors, um, uh, Patrick, would you kind of add some, I mean, what do you think about that? How do you think scripturally? Just that. <laughs> I've got more. I've got scripture I can go ahead and share if that'll give you a little bit more context to go on. Uh, let's jump into scripture. Let's jump into scripture. Yeah, and then we can start you know, trying to make sense of all that. So I actually had to go on a journey with this one because I've had different thoughts about it at different times and I've read different scriptures. I'm like, I don't know how to think about this, Lord. And so um, Israel was was the earthly kingdom covenant, right? Like God was establishing an earthly picture. Um, and as opposed to in the new covenant with Jesus, we are in the spiritual kingdom. Uh, in which we're not fighting flesh and blood, but principalities and powers of the heavenly places, right? So right now, it's about the covenant with Jesus that we receive the Holy Spirit and we're walking in the power by the Spirit, not by creating an earthly kingdom, Mm -hmm. right? And so I would say that the thing is, when I read the Bible in the end times, the earthly and heavenly kingdoms begin to merge, right? Right? And ultimately, at the end of time, there's a perfect heaven and earth that is a merged kingdom, right? Where you have both the, the earthly and heavenly kingdom perfectly going together. And so um, what I'd say, just kind of some examples, um, it says in Psalm 122, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Um, okay, that's a pretty fair, direct, like, hey, let's just let's pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Because just because it says that it's supposed to do, I mean, you could say maybe that's an old covenant thing, but um, sure, we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Um, to, and I, to be fair, we should pray for peace in every city. <laughs> yeah, but you don't see Scripture saying pray for the peace in another physical city, mm-hmm. like a physical geographic location. Pray for that place specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you could quote Jeremiah where. Uh, the Lord says, you know, whatever city you are exiled in, be a blessing, pray for its prosperity, you know. So there's some, but I know what you mean. It, it's not like there's all these cities being named. There's there's sure. the, the general idea, of course, pray for the people that you're among, but I get your point. Yeah, pray for the people you're among, but he doesn't say pray for this city and this city and this city yeah. for the peace of these cities, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's fairly general. Uh, it's not this like super direct command, you have to do this, but that's kind of a, a general principle that I think is good. Pray mm-hmm. for the peace of Jerusalem. Um, and so, but part of it is like when you see the spiritual and physical kingdoms merging in the end times, there are a lot of Jewish or there are a lot of Jewish things that happen, right? You know, it, it, it talks about 144,000 Jewish men who are marked, right? That seems pretty specific. It doesn't say 144,000 Christians or 144,000 general people. It's fairly specific. Like um, the temple is desecrated, right? Not uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or whatever, like not the the Vatican. It's the 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 temple is desecrated. Mm -hmm. Um, Not Saddleback. (laughs) Not (laughs) Saddle. Not Lakewood, right? Right. So, uh, you know, and, and the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, is the new Jerusalem. It's, yeah, it's yeah. a symbol. All these things are very Jewish things mm-hmm. that happen in the end times when the physical kingdom and the heavenly and the spiritual kingdom merge, right? And so when I think of something like praying for the peace of Jerusalem, I'm imagining these things that it's like, hey, these things are going to merge, and so we need to be praying for for this people group that still has these these symbols and these things that are important to God's heart mm-hmm. about them specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll talk more into the theology of that. But Patrick, did you did you want anything to that before we get into Romans? <laughs> <laughs> Just Romans. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I think it's a hard conversation to have until you can all agree you're saying the same things with the same words, you know? You know how we can we can say things past each other yeah. 
because we're saying the same words but meaning different things by it. And that's why the distinctions are so important. Like, we're talking about Israel the way, mainly the way the New Testament, the way like Paul or Revelation would talk about Israel, and which gets into like, you know, a psalm, which was written by a pre-Christ Jew, a song or a lament, uh, was written saying, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Well, probably because they were constantly being attacked by national enemies sure. and, and other peoples. And they're going, God, we need peace. Pray for peace. And we, of course, we want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Like right now, there's a war happening. And as Christians, we would rather there be peace there and everywhere, you know? So yes, pray for peace. But if we're thinking like New Covenant, if we're talking about a people group and Jerusalem is this representative kind of city, Jerusalem means the people, you know? It, it means it, not just this uh, city with boundaries, with city limits, drive in, drive out, but it means the people, mm -hmm. the seat of the people. And then you're thinking differently about it, to your point, you know, you're... You're, you're backing up and trying to see this from heaven's perspective. Who are we talking about, not what are we talking about? So I think that's a really important distinction because we're not trying to have a political discussion or a militaristic discussion about peace. We're talking about the peace that Jesus brings into the world through his kingdom. You know, he's, tr he's destroying the works of Satan. He's establishing his kingdom. His kingdom comes with peace. So pray for peace, yes, peace, that kind of peace. And so that's an important part of the discussion for me. And I agree, uh, there are all these, which you've seen firsthand, Catherine, you've been in these cities, you've been in Israel, and these places and these symbols and the geography of it that all mean something important to God that God chose this people group in order to call his people and give his covenants, make his promises, reveal himself, reveal his power and all these things. And then he came into the world as a Jewish person, you know, yeah. as, as a citizen of Israel, he came into the world to reveal himself that way. You can't make that unimportant. You know, the, the debate is whether, or you know, what, what kind of position does Israel have in like, in in terms of salvation? Is their salvation the same as Gentile salvation? Are they saved the same way everyone else is? Do they have a unique place in the future kingdom or not? You know, there's debate there, but there's no way you could debate whether or not Israel is important to God. Mm -hmm. Of course it is. That's why... It's a Jewish book. We've all devoted ourselves to believing and obeying, you know. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, if we can if we can move past the kind of underlying uneasy debate of how much do are we supposed to care about Israel? What we're supposed to care about is God cares about Israel, you know? This is important to him. He chose to reveal himself, he chose to fulfill shadows and types in Christ as a Jew. And then even when he shows up to John and says, let me show you how this is all going to end, it's very Jewish sounding too. All the fulfillments and who's going to be there and all that. So we, we just need to agree, like, this matters. It's important. It's, at, it's in the heart of God. And we're just trying to understand how do, we, how do we get in tune with the heart of God so that we can pray the heart of God. What what is it that he really cares about right. here? Because what I don't think it's yeah. national boundaries. You know, I think it's more. I, there's a place for that. Mm -hmm. I understand God gave land to a people. You know, but there's there's contingencies about their obedience and their belief and all those things. But I think it's more about the heart. It's about the kingdom that Jesus came to establish. So, I that's the discussion we're trying to have here. Is what's the heart of God? in relationship to Israel, how do we get in tune with that so that we can agree with him and pray for that? Is that fair? Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. What do you think, Catherine? Uh, those are some really good thoughts. Um, the thing that was kind of coming to mind is um, when we think about the Bible and when we think about the Bible as a story and about our place as believers in this story, I don't think you can get away from Israel. Like, it's not only is it important. It's like, well, what is the story that God has been telling? Like, from Genesis to Revelation, like, what is the story that he's telling? And I think in in America and really the Western world, we've kind of taken this and, you know, the new covenant, like, we have to remember that there's a story older than us, like so much older than us that we have the privilege to be a part of. And we were not even, you know, I mean, Paul talks about this. We'll probably talk about this a little bit more, but we're grafted in. Like we're not an original branch. And I think when we start to get outside of ourselves, like all this entitlement we kind of have as believers sometimes, this entitlement we get is, as kids, and I'm not talking about like the, the very real authority that we've been given as, as sons and daughters, like we've mm-hmm. been adopted. And I have the same amount of like love from my father that, that my natural brother and sister in, in the faith that our Jewish brothers and sisters have. Um, it's no less valid, but I think we have to view life through the story of what is he saying? Like, what has he said? And I, I think of um, in Genesis, and I know a lot of Christians, we quote this a lot, but um, God makes a promise to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you, um, and I will make you a mighty nation. I'm probably butchering it a little bit. Um, do we actually believe those words? Is, is God who he says he is? Is he a God of covenant? Is he a God who's unchanging? And we can get, I mean, I'm sure more into that, but um, I think the question really is, is is God's word true? And I know that there's a lot of interpretations, um, but to your point, Patrick, like I think we can all agree that that God, it doesn't, it matters to God's heart. It's not just like a point that we, we talk about in church. It's not just a hot button topic, but, um, I don't think you can get away from it when you, when you read scripture and when you insert yourself into the story, not look at the story and see how I, how, how, how does this relate to me? It's like, no, you actually, we're small, Mm -hmm. small itty bitty people. And God is big and, and God has a story that he's telling. Will you, will you jump into it? So those are my thoughts. That's good. That's great. As a reminder, the Prayer Culture Podcast is a ministry of two or more, which is a crowdfunded ministry. So if you enjoy this content, please check out our website and giving page listed in the description. Also, when you have a second, hit the like and subscribe button. Romans. Romans. <laughs> so so Romans does talk about this. And uh, it's funny because people can read the same passages and come to different interpretations. Love it. Um but really, when we, me and Patrick were talking about it before, it was like he came with Romans 9 first. So why don't you share what about Romans 9 stood out to you about this conversation? Like, Yeah. Uh, I mean, the thing, first of all, that stands out to me is Paul as a Jew and his aching for Israel to be united to Christ, for them to understand that he is the Messiah. He's the one they were waiting for. His heart just absolutely breaks, so much so that he's saying, I feel like if I could, I would give up my own salvation for them. That's wild. It's wild. That's just like, I am not. I don't know who I would say that about, <laughs> you know? Can we just add? Do we have to replace me? Can we just <laughs> add to me? <laughs> more, Can I stay? More chairs, more chairs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's pretty, that's very bold. You know, that's a stark, bold statement. So that's the first, That to me, that's the theme of Romans 9, 10, 11, is Paul's yearning, his aching that they would come in to the new covenant. They have an old covenant, but as we all know, it's passing away. It's it's failing. But But his point is, The word of God has not failed. That's what he's saying. Because, uh, and and this would be more along the lines of like a replacement idea. All who are Abraham's natural lineage are not Israel. Because he's saying the true essence of Israel is to be the people of God. 
and you're the people of God through faith in Christ. He's getting up, he's setting the bar to the highest place, ultimate kind of theology of salvation is you must be in Christ. So that's what it means to be true Israel, is to be, to belong to Christ. And apart from that, you, you have something old, something passing away, something meaningful that matters, but it's shadows. It's only, it's only shadows of a greater truth coming that's fulfilled in Christ. So you have to have Jesus to be a part of the kingdom of God. And when you put those th- two things together, it becomes my, my theology of Israel is the you must have Jesus, you must have Jesus, and our hearts must break Mm. that this peculiar people that God chose, that God made promises to, covenanted with, you know, carved out land for, protected, went ahead, split seas, you know, spoke to him through fire, and all these, these are this is special, and our hearts should break that they would miss what they've been waiting so long for, Jesus. Mm -hmm. A prophet will arise among you like Moses, but he'll be greater. And then to miss that Mm -hmm. when he comes, that should break our hearts, Mm -hmm. and, and you have to have him. So it's it's this mystery of like, well, are they different? Are they different from every nation? Yes. Do they get to the Father any other way than through Jesus? No, they don't. That's, that's to me the theme of Romans 9, 10, 11, what I feel like Paul is trying to get to. Do you think that, so from all that, do you think that the, that's the major distinguishing factor of Israel as opposed to, hey, I'm praying for Nation X, you know, I'm praying for Nigeria, right? Nigerians to get yeah. saved. As opposed to Israel, that because they're, they were awaiting the Messiah and they missed it, mm-hmm. that's the major distinguishing factor of them? I think so. I mean, it, okay, who, who are the... There are a lot of nations mentioned in the Bible, okay? But in terms of types of people... Two, Jew, Gentile. It's like... That's true. The Jewish people and everybody else who's ever populated the planet. Yeah. So the so obviously God has a distinction there, you know, and the Jewish people had the distinction. But Jesus talks about that distinction. Yeah. He talks about the Jews and the Gentiles. And so I think it's okay for us to think that way to a degree, that there, there is a dis, there's a distinction between Israel and everybody else because of how God has spoken to them, related to them, all these things. But there's no distinction in how you come to the Father. Right. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I know that there, are, there is a lot, there's a big portion of the church that believes that Israel is distinct even in how they come to the Father, that somehow there's an exemption made, or something like that, that they don't have to believe in Jesus, they're just the chosen people, these promises, you know, yeah. are irrevocable and things like that. Or maybe they have to be looking for the Messiah, and even if they didn't accept Jesus, if they're looking for the Messiah, then yeah, yeah. they're it, genuine. Right, Jesus. because that's a genuine waiting. Yeah, And there is something that's mysterious. You could probably speak to this because you've looked into the eyes of people that you probably felt like were sincerely believing a Messiah is coming uh, and that he just hasn't come yet. And then as Christians, we're going, you missed him. You know, he came to you and you missed him. (laughs) And here he is now offering himself to you and you're rejecting him. How does that, when you look into those eyes, how does that? Yeah, um, that's actually, that's such a good question. I... Um, currently, well, I, I'm having these conversations actually from a man that, um, we didn't meet him through it, but like from that trip, this relationship sprang out, um, from that trip. And he's a man who is a a, a Jewish man. He's a religious Jew, um, loves God with his whole heart, knows, knows scripture better than most Christians I know. Um, you know, knows, knows Torah really well. 
Um, and he's just looking, he's looking, and he, he basically like had an encounter um, with God while we were there. Um, so we're, we're just walking through through who Jesus is with him and how he is the Messiah, um, which is really beautiful. But I think at the end of the day, it says like no no man is without excuse, right? Like, and that's talking about probably general revelation. But every single human heart, once we are are presented with the truth of Christ, we have to make a decision. And I think the difference is I I saw people who were religious Jews who knew probably Torah, but probably knew, uh, you know, Talmud, all the religious books, probably a little bit more. Um, there was a hardening in their hearts. Mm. Um, and, you know, you could talk about Jesus all you want, or you could talk about even, and there's like a closed offness. Um, and there were several people, there were several people that I talked to who you could look in their eyes and there was almost like this searching, like they, they love God. They want to know God. They want to just do what he has commanded them to doing. Um, and they want to know the real Messiah. Um, and I think similarly to how, I mean, you would talk to anybody here who, who they're searching, there's just like this, I don't know, like this settledness in your heart, like oh, God's got them. Like, and, and it's difficult too when it's like, their conclusion is really just, well, Jesus isn't isn't the answer. Here, it's kind of usually like, well, I kind of like like my sin. I kind of like I kind of like living how I've always lived. Yeah. Um, there, it's it's just this. It's it's hard. It's a hard truth. Like you know your Bible better than well their Bible, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, better than a lot of Christians who have received Jesus. Um, you just come to a drastically different conclusion. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, um, but it's. It gives me hope because I think what God is looking for is people who fear him and he's looking for people who are humble. And if, if you are those two things, um, I really do believe um, God will bring like revelation of, of Jesus to those people. Um, and it's just patience, like I guess patience for those people. And um, yeah, the difference, the last thing I will say is the difference is a lot of the people who I talked to who just had this like question in their, like it wasn't just this like hardness of hearts like I could see in their eyes. Um, they they weren't hard to Jesus. Like there's people that you'll talk to who like they hate Yeshua. They'll curse him. They'll spit at him. Mm. Um, and yeah, I've, I've just talked to several people when I, when I explain who Jesus is, um, there's actually a pause in their heart. Like, wow, someone would actually die for me? Like, wow. Mm. Like, why Why would God do that? If that's if that's who God, like, why would he do that? So um, those are all over the place, but that was kind of... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, no, that's those are really some of my initial thoughts. That's really good. Yeah, so, so one thing I, I have noticed, I think, Patrick, you're right about kind of the theme of Romans... 9, 10, and 11. So this is the un- underlying theme. Hey, the Gentiles are grafted in, and true Israel is those who accept the Messiahship of Jesus. Um, but then he caps it off in 11 with a promise for is- Israel still, right? For the bloodline of Abraham, it seems. Um, and so that's where I would kind of like go, okay, here's a distinctness for Israel. So I'll, I'll just read it. It's Romans 11. 25. The title of the section is The Mystery of Israel's Salvation. So it's what we're talking about here. Yeah. Some uninspired person. <laughs> Some uninspired that. person wrote the header. It's true. Who really understood. Yeah. So scratch that. But uh, <laughs> in verse 25, so Romans 11, it says, Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. And as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards to the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers." For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that 
by the mercy shown you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. So here I think it it makes it clear that really that line, the fullness of the Gentiles must come in. I think that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24. Um, for people from all nations will hear the gospel and then the end will come, right? Um, that all the Gentiles need to hear first in some sense, and I don't think we're there yet. Uh, but when we arrive there, there is some move fully of Israel to receive God. Now, I don't know that that means every single individual who is a bloodline Jew. I don't yeah. know if it means that. But at at a minimum, it means a mass repentance of Jews to accept Jesus as the Messiah. Um and so I, I think that's where a lot of the distinctness lies, is God still has a plan and things that he has to fulfill for the bloodline of Abraham, um, not meaning that they get a free pass. Or, you know, right. right now, if you there are many Jews who do not accept Jesus. The vast majority of Jews do not accept Jesus as the Messiah, and they are not under God's blessing, and they will receive God's wrath. Jesus says this to the Pharisees over and over again. Like, it's so clear that that's true. But I think God is showing, hey, I still have a distinct plan and distinct promises for the seed of Abraham for the sake of the forefathers. Because of the things Abraham did, because of the things that Moses did, the things I called them to and where they were faithful, I'm still extending my mercy to them, mm. right, in a special way. Mm. Um, it doesn't mean that he loves us less. I don't really think it means that. Um, I think we have this cultural thing about fairness and individualism. Um, God, Jesus came and I think he showed the Jewish people, hey, God cares about the individual heart. But he also was Jewish, and we see with God the bigger picture, it's not just about individualism. There are communal covenant promises. Um, when you've lived in communal cultures, I know I have, you have, you've been to Israel. When you live in communal cultures, you see a very big difference in how people think. They think in terms of community, not individual, right? And so I think God, having the bigger picture, also sees the community of Israel and has a special design for them. And that I'm okay with that. <laughs> I don't have a problem with that. Right. You, you don't feel like you need to say, that's not fair. Yeah. I need their deal. <laughs> yeah. It, it does sound like, it's funny, you read that passage and, and the first thing you said was, so it seems clear that I was like, what part of that? Wait, read it again? <laughs> but it does, it does sound like what Paul is predicting is that at some point uh, connected to Gentiles enough, whatever that means, enough Gentiles coming into the kingdom through Christ, that connected to that, there will be some kind of mass repentance and return uh, among the Jews. And, you know, if we're just, if we're taking the whole Bible together and not isolating one passage, you know, but let the Bible interpret the Bible, then we would have to think, that what that means is at some point God will remove the veil or he will heal that partial hardening, which is an odd thing to say. There's been a partial hardening, and in this way all Israel will be saved. Wait, through the partial hardening? It's like maybe because it was only partial. Mm, maybe yeah. because it was temporary. It was serving a purpose. It was like, like this church age has been primarily about the Gentiles coming in. And that was, Paul called that, like in Ephesians, this mystery of the gospel, that even the Gentiles can come in, yeah. you know? That was a big deal yeah. in, in the first century, was Gentiles? What, what would they have to do with Yahweh? Um, so Jesus was opening that way. He was breaking down that dividing wall of hostility that stood between Jew and Gentile and making one new man in place of the two. That mystery just exploding throughout this church age. This has kind of been the age of the Gentiles, and it sounds like he's saying when this age of the Gentiles coming in is complete, then God is going to have some kind of mercy mm. on the Jews, 
And that blindness, that veil, that hardening is going to be removed. And, you know, when it says all Israel, it's kind of apocalyptic sounding language. Like it doesn't really mean every single person, but there'll be some kind of massive event of some massive healing of blindness and hardness that so many Jews are going to repent of their hardness they're going to see the truth about Jesus. They're going to believe in him as Messiah. What that means about all Jews ever, I don't know. That's wild. But in some way, a lot. <laughs> a lot of Jews turning to Jesus and being saved. And that would be taking the whole, let the Bible tell us what it means to be saved. It means to believe in Jesus. Yeah. And be reconciled to God through him. So I hope that's right. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I hope that's right. So from some of your description, Catherine, I think you've experienced this hardening firsthand a little bit. Tell us more about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whenever we went, you know, it's, I mean, the war is still going on. It's, it's the middle of the war. There are not a lot of, you know, Americans there at that time. Um, it was earlier this year. Um and so we kind of stuck out a little bit like a sore thumb. <laughs> um, and what was really interesting is the response that we experienced was not too far different from, sorry, I need to like scoot up a little bit. You're all good. Um, it was not too far different from, honestly, like the religious response that's here in America of like, I'm good. I've got it. Like I, I go to church, mm. um, in their experience, you know, it's a little bit more like, you know, I, um, you know, go to synagogue. I, you know, wear these, these clothes. I get this prayer, you know, this much amount of time. I, I read all these things. I do all the right things. I'm God's chosen one or mm. chosen one, <laughs> chosen people. Mm. Uh, you're not, we actually heard somebody say that, like, you're not God's chosen people. We are. Um, and at the root of it is really just pride at the root of it is religion um, that says, I do X, Y, and Z, and I'm good with God, and I'm good enough. Like that's Yeah, and even in, in an ethnocentric way. And, yeah. It didn't even have anything to do with, like, you could try all you wanted to. Yeah, but you're not God's... Yeah, you, you know, just weren't born right. Yeah, which, tough. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a tough, like, environment to walk in. Um, so what's really interesting, though, and, and we have to remember, like, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, but against um, you know, rulers, authorities, principalities. And, um, you know, for sure, you know, when we're there, um, you feel that principality of um, just religion, uh, the, the pharisaical spirit. Um, mm. The Pharisees put Jesus to death. Um, the spirit of the Antichrist mm -hmm. is there. Um, and maybe just to, to dial it back, the... The same, the same heart is there that that didn't want Messiah, that didn't really want Jesus. Um, so I don't. Did I think I'm like veering yeah, that's, off? That's no, kind of does that answer the question? That's, good. That, that's really good it, because we're talking about the right. source of the hardness mm -hmm. and the flavor of it, you know. And I think what you just said really gets down to it, like. If you think about the Apostle John as an older man writing letters to the church, uh, 1 John in chapter 2, he's talking about the spirit of Antichrist. And many Antichrists mm -hmm. have already come, you know, they went out from us, but they weren't of us. And here's how you recognize them. And that spirit of Antichrist has just been passed along through the ages. Yeah. I mean, they killed him, mm -hmm. and that spirit is still at work. Yeah. Uh, and not only among the Jews, but in all the world, those yeah. that's the spirit of Antichrist is working and turning people away from him. Uh, but certainly, you know, you've seen it firsthand, the anti-Jesus. In fact, in America, often it's just an apathy to mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm. It, that is the spirit of Antichrist being like he's meaningless, mm. you know, it doesn't matter. But you've seen where it's like, oh, I know Jesus is real and I hate him. Yeah. You know, I'm glad we killed him. Yeah. He deserves to die. Yeah. So that's whew, like yeah. that's. <laughs> 
Yeah, when we were there, there was a family that we were talking to. And, you know, at first, you know, we said, we're from America. We we're here to, to just um, love on people, bless them, and share Yeshua with them. And, um, you know, they, they, were, they were saying, you know, we, we love Pharisees. Like, if, if Jesus were here, and they said these words, if Jesus were here again, we'd put him to death again. Wow. And they were very, um, you know, they, they were glad that we were there. They are like, oh, thank you for coming. Then we start talking about Yeshua, and they're like, "I don't want to hear about that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear about that." Um, which I, I, that was just wild. I heard it from somebody's mouth. If Jesus, if Yeshua was here right now, I'd put him to death again. Wow! And they they <laughs> were talking. We were talking about Pharisees, and they were like, "Yo, oh, Pharisees! We love Pharisees! We love the Pharisees!" Yeah. And it was just it was just crazy. Like, yeah, yeah. just yeah. that. So, and that right there, it would be easy for someone to to get to that point of the conversation and become anti-Semitic. Mm. Without the heart mm. of God, you could get to that point and become anti-Semitic. And, and the church has been guilty in the past. Oh, yeah. There's blood on our hands. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it's terrible. Even yeah. some of these church fathers that we admire and yeah. read their books had some ugly theology when it came to the Jews. And we don't want to go there. Mm -mm. We want to be squarely in tune with the heart of God which is Paul's aching mm -hmm. for their salvation. Yeah. That's what we should desire because the spirit of Antichrist in anyone is not the person. Mm -mm. God, God's not willing any should perish. He wants all to be saved. He wants all to come to repentance. So we should love these people, yearn for their salvation, work toward their salvation, um, yeah but understand who the real enemy is yes. and yes. it's principalities, yes. rulers, authorities in the heavenly places. You know, that's, that's who it is we're warring against. Not, not any people group. Did you get him? I got him. Oh, that mosquito is driving me crazy. <laughs> Waging war. <laughs> As a reminder, the prayer culture podcast is a ministry of two or more, which is a crowdfunded ministry. So if you enjoy this content, please check out our website and giving page listed in the description. Also, when you have a second, hit the like and subscribe button.